It's time for All Hands on Tech. Climb on board as hosts Amina and Isaac explore all the amazing things happening in Nova Scotia's tech sector. Each episode, we will chat with local experts to uncover the secrets of what makes Nova Scotia the best place for collaboration, innovation, and creativity. All Hands on Tech is proudly produced by Digital Nova Scotia, the industry association for Nova Scotia's growing tech sector. Having a healthy work-life balance is vital to establish a long-lasting career, and working within the technology sector is no exception. Today, Isaac and I are joined by self-described personal productivity fanatic Robert Newcomb of Barrington Consulting to learn more about the role both employers and employees play to increase productivity and establish the optimal work-life balance. Thanks so much for joining us today, Robert. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. So maybe let's give you the opportunity to uh, share a little bit about yourself. What, uh, where do you come from? Where sure. do you call home? Uh, well, I guess home originally for me is Port Williams, Nova Scotia, and in, in the Valley. Um, so I grew up on a poultry and dairy farm there. Wow! So chickens, cows, tractors, growing the crops, and um, yeah, love it home. And I, I now reside in Timberley, so it's only an hour away from the Valley. But depending on who's asking and what day, I, home is truly the Valley for me. But I, I now call home Timberley. Um, And surprisingly enough, that's what led me to where I am today, being on the farm. Um, My background is industrial engineering. So I went to school my first two years at the Agriculture College in Truro, now Dal AC. Um, Did three years there after that at Dalhousie University and finished my industrial engineering degree. Um, But it was growing up on the farm in that need for process improvement. I was always looking at the way things were done. Um, You know, how are you cleaning out chicken barns? What tools, what equipment could be done better? You know, how do you make it easier on yourself? Because it is very manual labor and that kind of work. So I was always geared that way to think about how do I make these processes more efficient and more effective and easier and quicker. Um, And then I found out about industrial engineering. That was pretty much exactly what I was looking for. If you ask me about any other type of engineering, civil, mechanical, that's not my thing. I'm, I am i can't build anything. I built a deck <laughs> that's about six inches off the ground this summer. That's about the end of my... Uh, Listen, it's still an accomplishment, probably better than anything I can make. It feels really good, actually, <laughs> yeah. um, to, to use my hands and, and do something. But uh, yeah, so that's what kind of geared me into industrial engineering. So, so during school, I did co-op program. So my first co-op was actually at General Motors in Oshawa, Ontario. So seeing cars being built and being a part of that process um, and in really learning, you know, lean manufacturing and lean Six Sigma from, you know, the folks that have been doing it for quite a while now was really eye opening and, and seeing these robots building cars and putting everything together. And they had tens of thousands of employees there was really kind of cool. And so I was fortunate to get that opportunity through co-op. Uh, and then I did a co-op at Nova Scotia Power and that was the very first year they opened the building on Lower Water Street. So that was an amazing experience. And we were looking at that point in time at the LED streetlight deployment. Oh, yes, so yeah. replacing all the old you know, halogen lights and with LED streetlights. So that was a great experience as well. And then my final co-op was with Barrington Consulting. So that was summer of 2012. Um, really good experience. Really great team. Love the people. And I guess they like me too because they brought me back to start full time in May 2013. Nice. So that's when I graduated, and I've been there ever since. So it's been close to a decade now, full time with Barrington. Super cool. And what's what's your current role? So I am an associate partner at Barrington Consulting um, and co lead of the Barrington Ops practice. Nice. So Barrington Ops stands for Operational Performance Services, and we work with all types of businesses, uh, public sector, private sector. We do Lean Six Sigma training coaching and process improvement projects. So that's really been the bulk of my work for the last five or six years now. Awesome. So we're going to jump into some super quick rapid fire questions. So with the answers of these, we just essentially want the first thing that comes to mind. Of course, feel free to take a couple seconds, but we don't want you thinking too hard. Um, I'll kick us off and then Amina, you want to take the second? Yeah. Perfect. All right. So number one here. Does music help you concentrate? What would be your go-to genre? If so, wow, this is this is almost a little embarrassing. <laughs> um, my my go-to genre is heavy metal. To relax. To get in the zone. Um, wow, it makes you concentrate. Heavy metal. I, I I don't know if it makes me concentrate, 
Um, but <laughs> I, I find I get, I, I put, usually just put a song on loop. Wow. And What's I the don't go-to even. song? <laughs> <laughs> now you got to tell, the, like. The, um, the, the latest Lamb of God is what I've been currently really? listening to. Yeah. Okay. It's, it, it, that is intense metal too. It, it's, it's pretty heavy. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I mean, it just kind of blurs and blends into the background. And if I'm, if I'm getting in the zone, whether it's, you know, getting deep into a spreadsheet or <laughs> putting something together. <laughs> okay. So what's your favorite thing to do in Nova Scotia? Uh, I love the Valley. Um, so going back there, it's, it's nice to do the wine tours and, um, in Port Williams, it's now, I feel like it's this little capital of, of alcohol right now. (laughs) They got lovely (laughs) microbreweries there. They got the wineries, they got the distillery. Um, and people don't realize they also have the Allen's apple juice plant and they have a cheese host so you can get fresh milk too. So basically any type of drink. Um, is is available there. Um, so I, I love going back. And then I also love golfing. So I don't get to travel and, and play as much these days. I do have two young kids at home, um, mm-hmm. but I do love traveling with them. And, and we've been going to a lot of beaches uh, recently and the, the weather's been great this summer. So yeah, probably between traveling through the valley and, and different beaches, that's, um, that's our go-to right now. I think those are definitely uh, common Nova Scotian favorites. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so a little bit more of a work-related question now that we dived into uh, what you like to do and also music. Um, but what do you consider to be your, air quotes here, optimal work hours in a day? For me, I like getting up early. Um, so I find getting up early, working without distractions, especially you don't have emails coming in, you don't have the Teams chat or Slack or anything coming in to distract you. Um, I'll usually you know start earlier and, and do some of that. So. Sometimes that's as early as 7 a.m., depending on when the kids get dropped off at, at daycare and, wow. and when you kind of get in the role of things. But, yeah, often I'll start my day around 7.30. Um, I like being a little flexible. So if, you know, if it was a rough night or the kids are getting up late, starting a little later. Um, but, yeah, typically I look for, you know, 7.30 to, to 4 or so during the day. But that doesn't mean that some days are flexible and sometimes you get some evening work coming in, but usually earlier than, than later for me yeah sweet sweet um so i guess we'll we'll just dive into some questions um so many have heard of them but can you tell us more about lean six sigma and its principles sure yeah so as i kind of alluded to a little bit earlier with lean um when i lean came from toyota so toyota production systems um and that was really after world war ii so Japan obviously didn't fare out very well, and they were low on resources, especially natural resources to build cars and also low on cash. So they had to get a little bit creative in how they were manufacturing cars. And so they are the pioneers of of lean and lean manufacturing. Um, So if I was to boil lean down to four words, it would be add value, eliminate waste. Mm. So how can you make your your processes or whatever you do, you know, more valuable? Um, And all of that waste, all that thing that is getting in your way, um, if you're thinking of a a business perspective, all those things that a customer isn't willing to pay for, how can you reduce it if not eliminate it altogether? You know, it's changed the way we make things in manufacturing, but really it's now transcended all of these different types of of industries. So we're using lean now with government, we're using lean in financial sector, lean in, in manufacturing, obviously, but it's, there's really no processes or no type of work where where lean can't be used and can't be valuable. Uh, So when we talk about lean, we talk more about a philosophy and a culture than a set of tools. So usually if if people think, oh yeah, lean Six Sigma, are you a green belt, yellow belt, black belt? Like people that know a little bit about lean think about the belts, but it's really not about that. It's about growing the people, growing the organization and this philosophy of continuous improvement. So how do you make things a little bit better each and every day? That's really the the premise of Lean. And of course, Lean talks about you know high quality um, and workers contributing. So one thing that I, I got to see when I was at General Motors in Oshawa is what they call an and-on cord. So if you picture the manufacturing assembly, these cars are on an assembly belt and they're, they're constantly moving, they're not stopping. Um, so if you're a worker and you can't get your work done, 
then you don't want to pass on the defect to the next phase. Mm. So they have what they call the hand on cords. So they pull it and that's when a team supervisor or someone comes to help. So traditionally the thought was, let's just push it as fast as we can through and we'll figure out the defects and the problems later. And they quickly realized that's a way that, you know, it's, it's going to be a lot more costly at the end. So how can you motivate your employees and your staff and get them to understand, okay, raise your hand. It's okay to make a mistake. Let's fix that early, you know, make the problems uh, rise to the surface and, and fix that sooner than, than later. So I guess that's really the, the premise of lean. Um, you know, there's the Toyota way is a book by Jeffrey Liker and he talks about 14 management principles. So there's a lot more to it than just that, mm. but really it's about continuous improvement and, in making people and employees a part of that process. Yes. Yeah. So it's kind of more along the lines of being proactive about if you're making mistakes or realizing those areas for improvement along the way, rather Definitely. than waiting for something to happen at the end. Yeah. And it's, it's really the culture behind that. Mm -hmm. So making people know that their voices are heard, that they're valued and that they can, you know, bring up these things and they're not going to be, you know, challenged or disciplined as a result. Um, so it's, it's that whole culture and philosophy surrounding that. That's really kind of the big thing behind lean. Really interesting. Yeah. yeah. I like all these different, um, kind of like principles and stuff to help manage teams because so often we, we throw all these buzzwords around, but it's like, okay, like what, what does it mean? Like, what are, what is, what is this in practice? And so many people don't realize what it is until they actually see it happening. Yeah. Yeah. Do so, you have any examples of like. A, a moment where you applied any of the principles in like your work um, environment? Yeah, so we've, I mean, we we're working with a client and just recently we, we did a, a value stream mapping exercise. So that is one of the, the lean tools. And basically it's to look at the process from beginning to end. And most folks have heard of a process map and that's a little bit more detailed with the steps and like you can picture the swim lane diagram, decision blocks. It's very similar to that except it adds metrics to this. Oh, cool. So where is how, what's your processing time? So how much effort does it take for these activities? What's your lead time? So from the customer's perspective, how long does it take to move through each of the activities? Um, and that's where we're using it with many clients, um, you know, government or private sector. You know, if a customer submits an application, how long is it going to be until they hear back? Well, mm. that's lead time. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes it only takes, you know, whether it's minutes or an hour or two, if someone was focused on that to get the work done, it might only take an hour, but because it bounces around from inbox to inbox, from desk to desk, and it's waiting and people are on vacation, you know, a customer ends up waiting a month, yeah. but it really was only 60 minutes worth of effort. So yeah. that's what we like to kind of bring to the surface and, and map out as a, as a result of, of using a tool like a value stream map. Yeah. And as an old, old saying kind of goes, you know, time is money. Right. And if you're spending too much time on something, then you're also spending money in that same sense. Yeah. And especially like s customers and citizens, their expectations have changed so much over the past few years. Um, so if they can get it, you know, order on an Amazon and get it tomorrow, they're thinking, why is it taking so long for these other processes yeah. to get through my application or whatever it is? So you know, it, we've seen a lot of pressure in Nova Scotia to improve these processes because expectations have changed so much in the last few years. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, what are some of the most common misunderstandings in, in your experience um, when it comes to employee pro productivity? I, I think there's a lot of a lot of misunderstandings, but also a lot of different perspectives on employee pro Absolutely. productivity. And I really think it depends on the industry you're in and mm -hmm. the type of, of work you're doing. So. I'll speak to knowledge workers. I'm assuming that's most of the audience here and, and in tech. Yeah. You know, if you're able to, if you're coding or if you're taking your knowledge and, and creating something, if you're not just producing widgets, then, you know, you're you're a knowledge worker. Um, and I, I think the, the biggest misconception, and I think there's, it's becoming less and less of a misconception perhaps in the last few years, that productivity means being fast or producing the most output. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the old school thinking of productivity. If you're manufacturing vehicles, obviously the more high quality vehicles you can produce in a day, that's obviously a higher you know productive rate or higher productivity. Um, but when it comes to knowledge workers, if you can you know, doesn't really matter how t fast you can type, 
how many emails you can read or how fast you can send them. Are you really adding value to your services? Are you adding value to your customers? If you can bounce back and forth and answer emails all day and be on top of Slack, you know, is that really what's, you know, what you're getting paid to do? That's a good point. Mm -hmm. Is that why you're getting brought in? So it, whether it's emails or messages or all of these different things, you know, people think productivity is more output and being faster, Busy but it's work. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's about the value behind that. And oftentimes it's, it's saying no to the busy work and doing the hard, challenging, you know, deep work that is very, you know, difficult to do. And that's really what sets some businesses, you know, apart from others is they're able to get that valuable work and make a difference where a lot of the other organizations are just kind of bouncing around and perhaps stuck in what they're doing. Yeah, no, very, very good points. And I think I would agree, like in, in my experience, watching so many organizations, so many folks only see the, and I'm gonna reference kind of what I said before, but like time is money. They only right. see the dollar signs if they have that output. And I think the the car manufacturer is probably the, the best example and how often, you know, how, how often can you produce content or how often can you produce a exactly. vehicle? And if you can do it quick, even though it might not be the most optimal product in the end, they see that as success, well, but it's flipping that. And I think the challenge is it's it's easier to measure. Mm -hmm. Like it, if you're trying mm -hmm. to measure output versus value, output's like, okay, I'm doing this many posts a day, you know, this many videos a week, mm -hmm. you know, recording this many podcasts, talking to this many people, making this many phone calls, this many leads. Mm -hmm. It's it's easy to track and it's it has that feel good metric behind it. You can say, all right, my target this today is to call 10 people. And you call those 10 people and you make it in, in great. And that's what we call like a, a lead indicator. Mm -hmm. Easy to measure, but where's the success behind that? And are you doing the right things? So that's a very difficult question to ask. And, and that's really where the, the root of productivity is. At least my when I say productivity, that's my, my version of it is the value behind it. Um, but it, it is tough. Yeah, and I guess a, a part of your work is helping your clients with their success metrics. Like, exactly. how are you measuring, you know, what what your your teammates or your team uh, members are doing in, in, in a way that's productive for, you know, the business as a whole? Because, yes, like you mentioned, you know, I can sit on Slack all day and send emails all day. That doesn't mean I'm, I'm checking any boxes. It just means I'm doing the busy work. Mm -hmm. But, like, back to what you were saying, if you're doing that deep work, um, how many of – of the clients that I'm emailing is converted to, in my case, membership, or in your case, you know, engagement on social media, mm -hmm. you know, you know, how many listeners are actually on this podcast? Yes, right. we recorded it today. We're on episode six. That's great. But you know, have we gained more listeners? Have we? So you're, you're so right in saying that like the, the deep work is, is important and more so than, the, than that busy work. And especially it's, it's very hard with, with KPIs and metrics and, yeah. and whatever you want to call it that, um, you know, getting to really what matters. And for, for us, we talk about lead indicators and lag indicators. So lag indicators are, you know, results that have already happened. So if you're looking at monthly revenue or the past month's subscribers or number of listens, there's nothing you can do right now that's going to change that number. Um, and then there's lead indicators. And those are things that you can do on a day-to-day -day basis to help influence the lag indicators. Um, and you need a mix of both because, mm -hmm. you know, staff, they want to know what they can do today mm -hmm. to help influence the success of the organization and whatever those larger lead indicators are, whether it's revenue or, you know, subscribers or cost, quality, safety, whatever it might be. Um, but having the lead indicators to say, okay, this is what I can do to help affect that result is important. So you do need both mm -hmm. and you need to make sure that there's um, direct connection between the two. Yeah. Do you find there's a shift like in, w in within your work when you're consulting with businesses? Do you find some people are trying to hold on to like the older model of like output and what that means versus like what you were saying the deeper work of you know what what does the success look like? Do you feel like people are holding on to what that might have meant twenty or forty years ago, or do I, you see a shift? I, I am starting to see a shift. It's just it's hard to quantify and to talk about and mm. to, to actually, you know, measure. Right? Yeah. So sometimes people will just go back to the easiest thing to, to measure. Mm. Um, and, and for better or worse, you know, Peter Drucker's quote, what gets measured gets managed is mm. true. Yeah. yeah. So if you're measuring certain metrics and especially if you're measuring employee performance and you're, and they know you're measuring that, 
they're going to do whatever they can to affect that measure. Mm -hmm. So it looks good on them. Um, so if, if they get bonus points for showing up to the office early and staying late, and even if their butts in a chair and they're not doing much, then that's what they'll do. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's about what are they getting rewarded for? What are they getting measured on? And, yeah. and people will tend to kind of steer that way. And oftentimes it's not that, that simple. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. No. What are we, what are we rewarding people for and what are we looking for in employees is, is really, really critical because you know, if you're, if you're from the tippity top, if you don't set those expectations of what actually, you know, is, I don't want to use the word good work, but what is success mm. to yourself, either as a CEO or senior management, then those underneath you won't see that same way and won't see those targets the same way that you do. So right. being communicating communicating and, that is important and and sometimes the targets won't mean anything for them They're exactly all like, oh, right yeah. we have a an organizational revenue of 10 million dollars that's that's great woohoo where's that money going how does mm -hmm. that yeah. help me what do i do to help achieve that yeah. so it is kind of breaking that down and cascading that to say this is your role this is what we do as an organization and this is how you contribute and this is what it means mm -hmm. and this is end. how you're contributing to this greater goal of right. the organization yeah. so that not only do they feel like they're they're doing great work but they're also contributing to the organization or company as a whole in yeah. its mission and values right and i think that's becoming more and more apparent and important with with young employees today mm. is you know, what is the purpose of the organization? Yeah. What yeah. are we doing? I was just going to say, like, I, I know, like, now when I started a job or a new role, I always ask my, my you know, superior, like, what does success look like to you? Because right. that's different for, even when you have a similar title to, the, like, your last role, that's different for every individual. Kind of, yeah, yeah. That, that's different. And, and how do I fit into the bigger picture? And those are the right questions to be asking, too. Because mm -hmm. some people say, oh, well, our competitors and everyone else is doing a podcast, so we should do a podcast. Yeah. But but why exactly? Yeah. But why? And is this important? Like, is this going to matter to us? Yeah. Well, on on the podcast note too, because I think it's obviously most relevant. Um, but uh, in our first conversation with Reese, who who is one of the co-owners of Podstarter, where we're where we're recording today, um, he was saying, you know, there's so many people who get into podcasts mm -hmm. for all the wrong reasons, right. for the exact same thing that you said, Robert, that everyone else is doing it. So why don't we do it? Let's jump on the bandwagon. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. But then you know, in the end, you you don't have those. Uh, those set expectations or goals that everyone can feel proud about and feel involved with. And then it just kind of falls off the, the cliff. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to jump into the, the next question here, just cause I'm, I'm very uh, interested to hear your thoughts on it. Um, but how would you describe the optimal work-life balance and what would it look like in modern day? I think this is different for everyone. And I also think it changes for everyone too. So what I thought work-life balance was five years ago isn't what I think what work-life balance <laughs> yeah. is today. Um, so I, I think, in my opinion, it's really whatever makes you happy is work-life balance. And some people that, especially if they own their own business or they're doing their own consulting or freelancing, you know, they love their work and they're doing it, uh, I don't want to say 24-7, but kind of all hours of the day. And if that's really what makes them happy and what they're striving for, I, I call that work-life balance. And it's, I, I don't like the term work-life balance. I prefer something like work-life sway. Ooh, because ooh, I like that. I, I do think there is seasonality and in different times where you work, where you really got to lean into work, where you get to lean back and lean mm. into family or lean into your personal time or lean into friends. And I think different people have that different balance and different perspectives there. And I also think it, it changes. Like it, it shouldn't be the same all 12 months of the year you know sometimes it's summertime and work-life balance maybe tips a little bit more towards life and maybe <laughs> in the fall tips a little bit more towards work and yeah. trying to achieve a balance that says i'm only working eight hour eight seven and a half hours a day no more no mm -hmm. less and it's going to be steady and i'm going to clock out I, I think that works for some because i know some people that you know work in a hospital setting and they're full in it when they're there and they don't want to take any work home with them yep. when they go back home. And I think that's totally fine. And that's work-life balance where it's a little bit harder in the tech industry where you're always accessible by email mm -hmm. and you're doing different yeah. work and sometimes you need to catch up in the evenings. Um, but I, I think that's can be okay too because if you want to take an afternoon off to watch your kid's soccer game and having that flexibility, 
I think that's all a part of, you know, work-life balance. So, you know, whether you're thinking of it work-life sway, I also heard this analogy the other week about being a sponge mm -hmm. and sometimes you need to kind of soak it in and, and be right into work. And sometimes you need to yeah. twist it out. And, yeah. And I like that. It. I really like that. Yeah. No, and it's, it's so true. And especially about the fact that like, there's definitely certain seasons where you just, you got to put your head down and just power through yep. and get through those days. And then there's other days where you can be a little bit more lax and just have fun and, you know, mm -hmm. probably put more thought into the creative aspects of your job and less, uh, I, I'll call it grunt work, <laughs> <laughs> less of the, the rougher stuff. Um, but I, uh, someone once said to me that, um, you know, your job should, should, if you're in an ideal position for yourself and in terms of, you know, I'll, I'm going to use the word work life sway because I really like that. I, I think it's definitely not a balance. I think it definitely floats. Um, but uh, you should be doing, I think it was 70% of what you enjoy or what you're passionate about or what interests you. And then there's that 30% that's just kind of the necessary evil that exists that you're going to have to do every now and then. But you need to make sure that that percentage is something that you're comfortable with so that you do get that 70%, 65, whatever have you. Um, but it should never make up the, the bulk of your job. Yeah. And that's fair. And, and circling back to lean, you know, that's what lean is also focused on. It's that 30% that administrative grunt work yeah. things that could potentially be eliminated automated it's likely not adding value it's likely not where the value is coming from um so how can you aim to reduce and eliminate that and so it's not about you know there is this misconception that lean is about you know reducing jobs and saving money but it's really about getting rid of that you know waste work mm -hmm. and so you can have more time to focus on the value add work and that's usually what people enjoy and were hired for in the first place anyway. This is true. Yeah. All right. So uh, the second common misunderstanding, at least from my perspective, when it comes to employee productivity is that productivity is the employee's responsibility. And I think this is very common out there where people are just like, well, if only I took this type of training, if I learned how to use this software, if I could just figure out my system of how to go through all my emails and all this stuff. I mean, that's great. And, and that's actually what I enjoy doing too, is looking at my own personal productivity in those systems. But I think organizations should be taking more of a role in how they enable their employees to be productive. So it's setting up the right systems, the right environment, the right workflows to enable productivity because if you're just a cog in the machine and you have to figure out, okay, I'm getting Slack messages every minute of every hour, every day, and I'm getting emails every hour of every day, and I have to figure, and I'm getting meetings all the time because yeah. some organizations are getting, they're, they're getting booked in meetings eight hours a day. So when are they supposed to get the real work I done? Was just about, I was just thinking that. Oh, man, oh, man. There's, uh, I know um, Google Calendar recently uh, they added a new feature and it will track how often in a week you're in a meeting. So you can see that percentage and my goodness, sometimes like some, some days I'm like, all right, about I'd say 70% of my day is in and out of meetings. So then that gives me 30% of my day to actually do work. So that, that day is basically a write off. Right. And in out of meetings, there's usually tasks that come yes. out and action items or yeah. there's often and you have to sort them <laughs> emails and things you have to prepare for going into mm -hmm. meetings. Yeah. So now you're having meetings where people aren't prepared. And now some of your meetings are a waste of time because people are always <laughs> playing catch up and there's no agenda and there's no objective. Normalize writing up the agenda in the description in the calendar. Yeah. Put the agenda in the description in the calendar. Just yeah, it's, it's cool. that simple. You yeah. Want a meeting? You can. Here's the agenda. In the ca there's a spot for it. Yeah. <laughs> Anything. I'd say any meeting over 25, 30 minutes should have an agenda or at least I'd say even if not, it's not a laid out agenda, at least objectives or like these, this is what we're going to talk about. Mm -hmm. I don't want to see any blank. <laughs> That's what they meetings. have the description box. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. An objective and an agenda. This yes. is what we're going to cover. This is how long we think it's going to take. And this is what we want to produce as a result of this meeting. Yeah. Because if it's to get everyone up to speed, yeah. the meeting may not be the best place for that. You could probably send that by some other communication. Excel sheets, email. Yeah, so I think that's that's a big one. And and so that should be on the employee to try to navigate this sea of stuff. 
if you can have an if your organization can help organize and sort through that and, and create some I say policies I, I hate that because policies are <laughs> they're not overly helpful sometimes because people just avoid them or don't listen yeah um, but if they can help set up that culture to say you know what maybe one day a week we're we're going meeting free mm -hmm. or we recommend that you you know decline meetings or you don't have to be at everyone or if there's no agenda you can't have a meeting or you're allowed to decline a meeting yeah mm -hmm. and then you start setting up this this culture to say you know what this is where our best work's being done you know what's the balance between meetings how do we best communicate in our teams yeah. um, and now you're starting to see more you know daily huddles and daily stand-ups mm -hmm. as far as you know what are we going to do today what did we do yesterday what got in our way how are we going to best set each other up for success and how we do our work so whether that's enabled from the very top of the organization or, or teams can help create norms around how to be best productive i uh I'm a firm believer that it doesn't, it shouldn't start at the employee. I think that's kind of what needs to be done right now. Um, but it's it's very hard, and it feels like you're you're battling uphill sometimes yeah. um, to to try to get through it all in, in an eight-hour day. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so I got I got one more misconception, right. um, and I think the the misconception that productivity is best measured on a daily basis or a short ter short-term basis. Hmm. And I think we talked about this a little bit earlier, um, that your your best work isn't necessarily done if you're measuring by the day. Because if you think, okay, how am I gonna get measured for success today? Then you might you might do things that are detrimental to your long-term productivity and your long-term success. So for, for consulting, for example, our biggest measure is billable hours. So if I'm on client site and I'm billing, then that is good. That is a productive day. So, you know, seven and a half hours a day, if I'm seven and a half hours billable, 100%, that's great. But then if I was focused on that too much, then what do I do if I'm invited to a podcast? Mm -hmm. you know, uh. I'm not billing anyone for this. You know, how do you enable those supporting and enabling activities if you're too focused on that short-term success and those mm -hmm. short-term productivity metrics? So again, those are often the easiest ones to measure but sometimes you really need to take a step back and saying, is this good for the long-term perspective of our organization? That's a good point. Yeah, very good. So you might be able to think of some examples in your own business that you say, you know what, if I had a, a good day or if I was being measured on how productive today was, these are the things my supervisor or boss might be looking for. But mm -hmm. you know, if at the end of the week, at the end of the month, end of the year, that's probably not gonna be the most productive day in, in hindsight. Yeah, no. That's not going to be something on that uh, that day in particular that pops up on your performance review and stuff right. like that. You're going to be looking at those big big ticket items. Right, mm -hmm. and and those big ticket items often need a lot of supporting days. Yeah, which at the time don't look that important or that valuable, but they really do add up. So how do you incorporate that into your productivity and measurement system? Yeah, Definitely. I think it's critical that we as uh, you know kind of working individuals kind of reinvent what productivity in air quotes kind of is to each individual person because I know myself I every time I, I close my computer for the end of the day regardless of what time that end of the day is um, depending on the day uh, I want to make sure that I'm closing my computer and I'm like cool I had a productive day I feel good about my day I can go to sleep at night I can wake up in the morning I can feel refreshed but there's nothing worse than closing your computer and being like oh like I have this to do I have this to do I have this still to do like I only got a little bit done of that blah 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 and um, we just need to learn internally that even though we don't maybe check off the entire box, if we do 20% of that thing that needed to be done, 50% of this, yada, 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 it, that's still productive. Yeah. And I, I find the biggest thing for that is, is having a plan for your day in advance. Mm. So at the beginning of every week, I create a weekly plan. This is basically the, the big ticket items that I need to get done this mm -hmm. week. So I'll throw it in the calendar. If I think it's gonna take three hours, I won't necessarily block it in my calendar saying I can't take any meetings, but I'll at least put it in there because it's gonna take some time to do this week. Mm -hmm. And then at the beginning of each and every day, I'll say, okay, what do I need to get done today? What are my meetings? What are my other obligations outside of meetings? How can I structure and fit my day together so I'm not going back and forth between all these tasks? So I try to block email twice a day in my calendar. And this, this is so hard and I am still battling with it um, and even though like I t 
tell people that they should do it. And I, I'm still working on it every day. But if you are checking email every five or 10 or 15 minutes, if you have your notification on and you are constantly getting distracted, you're not going to get anything done during the day. Yeah. No. Yeah. So you definitely have to have those, yeah, those time slots, yeah. those chunks. I don't want to interrupt, but it's this time for tech tips. Oh, so uh-huh. I want to pause the conversation and we'll do tech tips. But <laughs> so as you were saying, what is time block planning or time boxing? So time block planning, uh, it came from that terminology anyways, from, from Cal Newport. So he's written a few books such as So Good They Can't Ignore You. Most people know him from Deep Work or Digital Minimalism. And it is about planning your day in advance and blocking off time to do all of the activities that you need to do. So meetings are obviously, they're already in your calendar, so they're planned for your day. But what are those other activities that you need to get done? How long do you estimate those activities are going to take? How are you going to fit those in your day? And then even those smaller, minute tasks, you know, you're not putting each one of those individually into your calendar, but can you block those together into a time to get those all done? And I especially try to practice and appreciate that if it's all email based or all based on your computer, block those ones together. Mm -hmm. If it's phone calls you need to make, block those ones together. Mm -hmm. If it's errands you need to run, especially by location, block those ones together. So you're, you're, it's almost like a chess game that you're playing at the beginning of your day. And it's like, okay, I need to get all of these things done. I have all of these puzzle pieces. How do I best fit them together to, to manage my day? So I like to, if I'm, since I'm not going downtown very much, I'm working from home most of the time. If I do need to go downtown, I try to put all of those actions and activities all in the same day. Um, and similarly, you know, if you don't want to go back and forth between projects, then you're blocking off maybe one part of the day for one project and the afternoon for another project. So you're not, you're, you're structuring your day so you don't have to multitask or switch task the entire day and you can kind of get into a bit of a flow. So that's the other big piece of time block planning is if you need to be on distracted, so you're not looking at Teams or Slack chat or emails, you're blocking that time off, maybe even disconnecting from the internet and and getting that work done in a focused manner. Yeah, I think that's really, really effective, especially um, I'm thinking about, you know, a lot of like the in-person stuff, if you have to travel a bit, that you wanna make sure you're getting all that done in one space and time and also if you have to socialize with other people like i don't i know there's plenty of extroverts out there but uh, even Mm -hmm. if you're not especially if you're not an extrovert but even for the extroverts um it's time consuming and sometimes you got to get yourself hyped up or in the mood to be able to socialize or network so being able to kind of do that all together and then go back i'm going to keep using the word grunt work but to go back back and uh, start doing the grunt work again or get, do creative tasks i know creative tasks especially i can't like if i'm looking at spreadsheets all day i do not want to do anything creative for the rest of the day because my head is just spreadsheet mode so it's it's nice to have those those time set right that. and some people like certain types of work at certain times of the day yeah so if you're feeling true, more actually, creative yeah. and energetic in the morning then that's your time if you are a night owl and want to book off time to get that done after dinner then that's really about time block planning it's it's being very purposeful of how you're planning your day and when you're going to do those activities and i think we like i was trying to, i'm like googling the word i'm looking for but we run human beings run on the cycle circadian rhythm circadian rhythm oh thank you for we're being on the same <laughs> wavelength <laughs> right oh, perfect there you go and i know that there's times um where you're more in the day where you're more focused there's times when you're like um hand-eye coordination um is better there's times where like i know in the morning they always say because like you should get some sunlight in and, and that's when you should get moving and like enter like get energized even on an empty vessel sometimes and then after you eat that's kind of when you're more creative and you're more like willing to do those those not the spreadsheet thing yeah but, more, you know like graphic designing yeah and, more creative um, and, and that kind of thing and there is a time when you're starting to you're more social and then you, you start to kind of wind down a bit yeah, and i think everyone's wired a little bit differently there too yeah. so Absolutely. knowing your own rhythm and habits yeah. and likes is, is good to plan your day around that yeah yeah perfect lovely well thank you so much perfect that yeah. was it, that's, that's all it. from us. That's yeah, that's that's a wrap. <laughs> it was it wasn't too bad, was it? No, easy peasy.
thanks so much for for um coming here today robert and for um answering all our questions oh, thanks mina thanks isaac uh, appreciate being here and um yeah best of luck with the podcast maybe now you'll think about productivity exactly and yeah and listen i was I, I wanted to be here taking notes but then you'd hear me like tick, 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 typing on them but that's the <laughs> that's the beauty of my my role in editing is that i get to listen listen back and take notes yeah my right. little cheat sheet awesome thanks for tuning in to all hands on tech interested in learning more visit us on our website at www.digitalnovascotia.com we'll see you next time this has been a